Hey, welcome back to my channel. It's Christine Grace and today is another reaction video. Today I'm going to be reacting to one of my favourite YouTube channels. They are called Aperture. They make really thought-provoking videos and their animations are great. Need I say any more? Why don't we check it out together? This video is looking into the great filter. If you don't know what it is, you're about to find out. <laughs> 4.18. This number is the reason that you're alive right now. Under normal conditions, that's how many joules of energy you need to raise the temperature of a gram of water by 1 degree Celsius. Also known as the specific heat capacity of water, this value, this property of water, it's special. You see, if this value were any different, life as we know it would not exist. If it were higher, more energy would be needed to raise the temperature of water. The amount of water that evaporates into the atmosphere would reduce, and that means so would rainfall. This also means that there would be a greater difference between the temperature of air near land and the air near water. The resulting changes in pressure would lead to changes in the wind speed, temperatures would significantly drop, and species would slowly go extinct. On the other hand, if the heat capacity were lower than it is now, water would evaporate much quicker, and it would no longer be able to regulate the temperature of the earth as it does now. It would rain all the time. Crops would die, and again, species would slowly go extinct. 4.18, it seems, is just the right amount of energy. This just rightness is seen in other aspects of life on Earth too, including where it sits in the solar system. Too close to the sun, and the water would just boil away before it could form. Too far, and it would just freeze. But all these properties are in some way, shape, or form related to water, and so it's no wonder then that the search for life anywhere in space is essentially a search for water. And we found it. Lots of it, actually. You see, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and oxygen is the third most abundant. In between them is helium, which doesn't really react with much, so when the conditions are appropriate, water can be formed. And it is. Given the scale of it all and how old the universe is, you'd imagine that there must be some planets in an Earth-like distance from their respective stars to allow for the formation of liquid water, and by extension, life. Dr. Frank Drake attempted to answer this very question in 1961, using the Drake Equation. He used factors like the average rate of star formation, how many of those stars could have planets, how many of those planets might develop intelligent life forms that could possibly communicate, and so on. Instead of the entire universe, Drake focused only on our galaxy, which is huge and for practical limitations of speed and time, really the only thing we should worry about anyway. Understandably, these inputs are all assumptions, and as such, the output of this equation is also an assumption. Depending on who and when you ask, the result of the Drake equation could be anything from a small number that is barely greater than zero to a number in the tens of millions. Our intuition tells us that if that number were somewhere in between that immense range, the Milky Way should be beaming with advanced civilizations making interplanetary journeys with regularity. Just our galaxy, one of the trillions out there, is so incredibly large that even with astronomically low odds, you would expect to find at least some other civilizations. To give you a sense of how large it is, modern humans have been around for nearly 200,000 years, and in that time, light, at its incredible speed, has traveled the complete width of the Milky Way. Only twice. Okay, so let's run through this. The Milky Way has a lot of stars, and a lot of those stars have a lot of planets, and a lot of those planets should have a lot of water, and a lot of those planets have been around a lot longer than Earth, so therefore they should have a head start compared to Earth. So that must mean that there are civilizations a lot more advanced than ours, which should have all the tools they need to communicate with us. If that's the case, there's just one problem. Where is everybody? That's the question Enrico Fermi asked in 1950. Using a similar line of reasoning that I just talked about, Fermi too was confused as to why we hadn't already come in contact with aliens, considering how abundant they should have been. Known more popularly as the Fermi Paradox, this question draws attention to the discrepancy between the supposed high likelihood of civilizations out there and the lack of observational evidence to prove their existence. To this day, 70 years after Fermi's equation, even with the scientific advancements that we've made, we are yet to receive any signals from a civilization other than our own. So really, where is everybody? Nearly 50 years after Fermi asked his famous question, an economist named Robin Hansen figured that, just as humanity had done in the past, we may have just been asking the wrong question all along. He felt that, instead of sticking to the assumption that the universe should be filled with life forms like our own, we should accept what the evidence is telling us, that life is exceedingly rare, and that the Earth is the only planet we know that has it, and that we should use that information to understand why we're here and how long we might have. Well, if that's the case, Hansen argued, then there must be something wrong with the typical steps of reasoning that lead to the incorrect perception of life's abundance. Either one or more of these steps are wrong, or one or more of these steps are so incredibly improbable, life elsewhere is practically impossible. 
And thus, the idea of the Great Filter was born. A hindrance that is so immense in its complexity and improbability that we are quite literally the only species to ever get past it. It's perfectly possible that the Great Filter was whatever initiated abiogenesis, the creation of life from non-living, simple organic compounds. After all, it's a process that runs counter to the laws of thermodynamics, in that it involves molecules to spontaneously arrange themselves in an ordered and life-giving manner. It would be like a cold cup of water just naturally going hot. Which, by the way, is physically possible, only unimaginably unlikely. Things like that just don't happen. Hot things go cold and things tend towards disorder, so life never really should have formed. The Great Filter could also be the formation of complex celled organisms. It took me ages to understand the concept of entropy. I was doing A-level physics. I think it was only like the last two weeks I was properly able to wrap my head around the, the idea of entropy. Do you want to take control of your financial future but don't know where to start? Noble Gold Investments understands. Investing in precious metals may sound confusing, but the team at Noble Gold Investments makes it easy. Don't settle for financial uncertainty. They'll suggest options to see if you can diversify into gold and silver. Right now, Noble Gold Investments is offering a free 5 ounce silver America the Beautiful bullion coin for qualified accounts. Don't settle for financial uncertainty. Noble Gold Investments has an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau and countless 5 star reviews. Why wait? Go to noblegoldinvestments.com now. noblegoldinvestments.com, the only gold company that I trust. Or, it could be the first proper replication of DNA that allowed for just enough mutation that would eventually sow the seeds for evolution. Or, it could be the collision of Earth with a protoplanet named Theia that led to the creation of the moon, and with it a reliable access and a stable climate for life to flourish in. It could be a lot of things, really. I don't know. Regardless, if we were to assume that the Great Filter was indeed in our past, it would explain why we are the only ones remaining and why the rest of the universe seems so utterly dead. But, it would also say that we have done it. We've made it past the Great Filter, everyone gets a pat on the back, and that's really it. But what if the Great Filter is ahead of us? What if the universe was, indeed, beaming with life just as we expected it to? But something simply kept filtering or killing civilizations one after another, which is why no one has really reached out to us. And more importantly, what if we're next? Given the general lack of evidence regarding other planets and why they don't have life, a filter in the future could be just as likely as one in the past, if not more likely. So, what are some of the possible filters that could possibly wipe out life as we know it? As it turns out, the abundance of galaxies that we point to when we search for other forms of life may just be the very reason why they don't exist. Our neighboring galaxy, Andromeda, is a mere 2.5 million light years away from us, but scientists predict that it's getting closer, in about 4 billion years, it might collide with the Milky Way. These collisions are common. Yeah, I've heard this too. I it was a while back that I learned. Um, you might find it interesting. You might already know. I found it really interesting when I learned it. At the center of galaxies is uh, supermassive black holes, and essentially all of the the stars in the galaxy orbit the black hole in the same way that planets orbit stars, which is really cool. And the idea is that Andromeda and the Milky Way are sort of headed towards each other, um, and eventually they will collide, and therefore the the two black holes in the center of the galaxies will collide and form together. I can't remember if they're spinning or if one of them is spinning. But I do remember there was there was a sound that they were able to generate of two spinning black holes colliding. Um, and obviously black holes are like the hugest thing in the universe um, and they're, they're massive. That's why you get super massive black holes. So you would think it would be this really chaotic, heavy, dark sound. Um, it was actually a really cute little sound um, <laughs> of these two super massive spinning black holes colliding. Um, definitely go check it out. It's, it'll be on YouTube. Just look up two spinning black holes colliding. I'm not sure if it was LIGO that discovered it. I know that it was LIGO that discovered the gravitational waves in 2014, but I could be wrong. Go check it out. Often the cosmic timescales that they're important. And although the likelihood of planets colliding with each other is exceedingly rare given the distances between stars and planets, other massive objects might interfere with the effective gravity of Earth, or whatever planet humanity is on when Andromeda and the Milky Way galaxy collide. This might plug them out of the orbit they were in, and jettison them out into the emptiness of space, where life simply ceases to exist. Extrapolate this possibility far enough, and you have a possible explanation as to why life is so rare. The cosmic commonality of galactic collisions keeps destroying life before it can take an intergalactic form. We've just been lucky so far. but. You might think that galactic collisions are super rare and still in the distance, so how about we focus on something more closer to home, something more recent instead. In 1989, millions of people in Quebec woke up to heaters that were no longer working, in a city that was completely out of power. 
In one of the rare and extreme cases of coronal mass ejections, or simply solar storms, Quebec's entire power grid failed after 90-some seconds of this geomagnetic storm from the sun. Effects were felt in other parts of North America and beyond as radio signals were jammed, satellite measurements went haywire, and elevators stalled. Each of these solar storms can carry well over 100,000 times the energy of today's nuclear arsenal, so they're not to be taken lightly. But typically, these storms are distributed over the entire volume of space around the sun, so by the time it reaches Earth, most of it simply dies out. The Quebec-style outage is certainly rare. Scientists only predict such storms once every 100 years. But one only needs to think of a world where we rely on electricity more than we do now. We're not just our phones, but our cars, planes, and even the military run on electricity. This is why these solar storms are classified as high-impact, low-frequency risks. They don't happen often, but when they do, they can be catastrophic. On the 15th of February, 2013, a dash cam in a car captured what is perhaps one of the most iconic space-related videos of recent times. Known as the Chelyabinsk meteor, it had entered into the Earth's atmosphere undetected, and due to its high velocity and shallow angle, had turned into a bright, brilliant streak of light that was at one point brighter than the sun. Before atmospheric entry, this 20 meter wide object was believed to have had the energy of a bomb that is roughly 30 times more powerful than the one detonated in Hiroshima. It injured nearly 1,500 people and damaged over 7,000 buildings from shockwaves of the initial explosion. New evidence keeps emerging about the extinction level threat that asteroids possess. You would think that with such a strong presence in pop culture and wisdom from the leading scientists of the world, the modern world would be much more aware of a threat than ever before. But we're actually pretty underprepared for such an event. Initial plans included nuking the asteroid, but that would in turn lead to smaller radiation-bathed chunks falling back onto Earth. Genius idea there, boys. <laughs> Another strategy could be to fly a ship to the asteroid to create enough of an impact to shift its trajectory. But a 2019 paper from John Hopkins University suggested that asteroids are stronger and harder to destroy than previously thought. And given a large enough asteroid, none of these measures may be enough to save life as we know it. I chose these events specifically because they're all things that have already happened, albeit at a smaller scale, and continue to happen at a regular basis, galactically speaking. And while extinction level events are rare, and very unlikely in the generations to come, we must remember that if life can sprout from improbabilities, it can end with them too. These are just some of the ways civilization can meet its end. Everything from social media, to a global pandemic, to civilization itself could be hypothesized as the great filter that awaits us as humanity's final test. But as always, there are some fundamental flaws with the idea of a great filter, and the definitions of life it relies upon. Our sample size is one. This one data point is all we have ever known. How can we say with such confidence that a life form, advanced or otherwise, would even bother to explore beyond the comforts of its own home? Just because we exhibit colonial tendencies- It's Neil deGrasse Tyson's point of intelligence, isn't it? You know, we're assuming that all other life that develops is going to have some kind of intelligence like we do and therefore want to have that human desire to, to explore, which is a very ignorant presumption, isn't it? We don't know that any other life form that develops is going to have intelligence at all or consciousness. It does not necessarily mean it has to be a universal phenomenon. And what if life just is different elsewhere? What if, instead of water, life lives off ammonia, or methane, or another such solvent, and the life that develops in it is fundamentally different from our own? Our current definitions of life are simply too specific to be able to incorporate all the possibilities hidden in the vastness of space. And then you go to someone like Brian Greene and you look at the possibility of, say, a multiverse and, and what if each universe has its own law of physics in that set universe and for each bubble of a universe in the multiverse, there's set laws of physics that only allow for one type of life form in that universe. And, you know, there's a great TED Talk video that um, I, I believe it's Brian Greene. I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure it's Brian Greene and he's talking about the multiverse. Definitely go check that out. But, but that's another possibility. How, how do we know that, you know, we're our presumptions for, for life are, are just based upon our life? You know, we only have us as a sample. But what if this whole universe is just for us? And what if this isn't the only universe? You know, who knows? We, we just don't know. That's the honest truth. The idea of the Great Filter is shrouded in such deep improbabilities, in such extreme extrapolations that it is sometimes hard to pay attention. It is one of the more hypothetical topics out there, with so much simply based on speculation. There might as well be no Great Filter after all. The improbability of our existence may not be because of one or two steps in the line of reasoning, but because the entire process is one life nourishing coincidence after another. The Great Filter seeks to remind us about how lucky we are. Lucky to be here, at this very moment, out of the billions of years for which the universe has existed. Lucky to have come this far and be so aware of our place in reality, and lucky to realize how fine-tuned the universe seems to be for you and me to live in it. 
from the position of our galaxy to the exact values of the natural constants, one after another, from water's abundance to its specific heat capacity. 4.18 So yeah, Aperture are a really great channel. You should definitely go check them out because, uh, yeah, as I said, very thought-provoking stuff. But yeah, I've given what I think in this video. I'm no expert whatsoever. Um, this is just what I think and my own little ideas and things that bubble around in my little brain. Why don't you let me know what bubbles around in yours in the comments below. If you have any videos you think I'd be interested in, why don't you leave them below and I'll be sure to react to them on the channel. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up on your way out and be sure to subscribe to my channel to keep up to date with all of my reaction videos and go check out my series Debunking the Lunacy where I give my research and thus conclusions based upon that research on some of the current atrocities going on in our society and I'll be sure to see you over there.